Hello, and welcome to this, the Lord's 77th episode of the Duels of Manadors podcast. I am Connor. And I'm Sam. And we are the Dungeon Bros, but we are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. And today, yet again, more commander nonsense, because we can never just have, like, a calm week anymore, apparently. Uh, yeah, it, the Wizards taking over control of Commander Format, we'll get into that, obviously. Uh, the Competitive Commander Collective, are people going to be separating CEDH and EDH? Uh, I think it's a little silly. Uh, we'll, we'll gloss over the, the Dungeon Master's Guide, because they've been releasing a lot of information on that, and it's kind of all the same stuff we've been talking about since Gen Con, so nothing really crazy there. And then PETA is getting into D&D. Yes, that PETA. So, you know... It's a whole thing, but of course we're gonna we're gonna just kind of relax a little bit, stretch our legs, get in get into the groove of the podcasting. How have you been, Sam? What have you been playing? What have you been doing? Well, uh, yeah, since we last talked, it's uh, the the weather has changed once again here in the uh, in the <laughs> yeah. tri-state area, and we had a drought, and uh, the hurricane fixed the drought. So the, hur- the hurricane uh, very rapidly fixed the drought. Fun fact: we're still like an inch and a half under what we're supposed to be in terms of rain this year. <laughs> but yeah. we were like seven <laughs> before. <laughs> yeah. So um, other than that, uh, you know, I've been really uh, getting into the Duskborn cards that mm-hmm. I, po- I pulled. I went ahead and bought myself a little extra bundle because I didn't really like Ooh. what I got in my pre-release kit. Got some cooler cards out of the bundle. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I built a Swarm Weaver deck. Got oh, some cards on the way for okay. that. Okay, that's fun. That's mm-hmm. fun. I'm working on uh, the Arabella, the the doll that's an uncommon yeah. legend. I'm working a PDH version of that because, I, like, every time you attack, you're draining, you're draining and gaining X yeah. from everyone. Like, I feel, I feel like that plays very well in just like a go wide tokens thing. And because mm-hmm. it's a trigger, at when she attacks, you can resolve that trigger. It's based on like creatures' power two or less. And then you can pump everything up after that ability resolves, so you can get both the benefit of the drain and then also a high, like higher attacking power and toughness creatures on the attack. So it's a whole thing. Um, yeah, that's that's fun. We had we had our own magic night. We 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 yeah. gathered here at the at the new homestead to play some magic. It was fun. We had Costco for food. It was delicious. Uh, I got to play the Burmaz Blight of Arescos. For the first time, a little Phyrexian, little Phyrexian typo thing going on. Um, that was a long game. <laughs> it was a much longer game than I think we were planning <laughs> on. Yeah. Um, we do have a Duskmorn set review that we're going to be recording tomorrow with our friend Wyatt, typical Gemini on YouTube and TikTok and all of the places. Going to be going over all the Duskmorn stuff. We wanted to do it a little earlier. Um, I decided to be selfish and say we're going to play magic instead. So, sorry, but that happens. It's it, life gets in the way. We're not professional podcasters. We're hobbyists at best. <laughs> um. Anyway, it's true. Very true. Very true. Um. Anyway, well, that's. I'm not really doing much anything else other than working and working on the house and trying to make cats be friends when they're not used to having other cats around. It's a whole. No. It's a whole thing. It's a whole thing. But the Duels of Mandarks podcast, you can get every other week on Monday for free feeds, free to everyone. Or you can get it the previous, the earlier time of the Wednesday over at the Patreon at the $5 tier, patreon.com slash the Dungeon Bros. You can join for free if you want to get uh, access to ask questions on the podcast, which is very nice. You can join for $5 for early ad free access to all the podcasts, $15 to get your name read. At the end of the show, you can get us on Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube, music. No, no more Google. Sorry. Sorry. What am I talking about? There is no, I, I, I even deleted it from the rundown of things. Google Podcasts dead deceased gone forever so apple spotify youtube music you can follow us on all the socials uh also if if i know some people like certain podcasting apps i'm an apple podcast guy myself if you on patreon you can get the the podcast feed as an rss link and then put it into whatever podcasting service you so choose that's a feature that i've been aware of but i've never said before the cat's playing with the d4 cat toy so 
it's a good toy. Yeah, this is a very good toy. The D6 and the D4 have held up shockingly well in the last year. They're like little <laughs> crafted, like craft show things that some some women made, and uh, the cat loves it. Also, before we were recording, she kept hopping up and like trying to like get attention right here, so that might happen at some point. Anyway, <laughs> let's go over the upcoming releases in Dungeons & Dragons and Magic the Gathering as we do every other week, or every other week on the podcast. Sam, what's coming up? So, in the world of Dungeons & Dragons, the Player's Handbook is out now. It's been out for a couple weeks, and a lot of people are starting to see uh, all the changes that have been made, and I've seen a lot more content uh, on the YouTubes and the TikToks about... A lot more positive content, I might add, A as lot well. more positive content, yes, about mm -hmm. the great changes that have been made. Uh, but that's out now. Next up, in about a month, we have the Dungeon Master's Guide coming out. Mm -hmm. Very, very exciting. We've got some preview stuff. They've begun their preview cycle for the Dungeon Master's Guide. Uh, it's kind of all the same stuff we've been talking about on the podcast for, for several episodes now with what we learned at Gen Con. Uh, they haven't really gotten into any of the details. I still want to see the like meat and potatoes of the magic item crafting system they have, but we'll get there. We'll get there. And uh, wrapping out Dungeons & Dragons, we have the Monster Manuel. Uh, mm -hmm. That will be coming out February 18th of next year. Yes. yes. Mo moving on to Magic the Gathering. Duskmourne House of Horrors is out now. Uh, like we mentioned, we will be having another uh, talk about that with our friend, Typical Gemini, uh, available here soon, hopefully. Probably um, next Wednesday. Wednesday the... Have... Wednesday yeah. the... Um, um, 16th? Probably the 16th? It's fine. That we don't have another set sure. coming out for a while. <laughs> That's true, because uh, the next thing we'll talk about is not a set, but it's the Mystery Boosters mm -hmm. 2, which will be available for MagicCon Las Vegas on October 25th for t through the 27th. Those will be fun. Um, the, you know, the Magic, uh, the Magic Mystery Boosters 1 were uh, well-known and uh, very, very fun, and these should be even more of that. Yeah, I'm still intrigued to see if they're going to do, like, uh, game store versions, like, non-convention mm -hmm. versions of the Mystery Boosters 2 eventually. Uh, they don't seem to be planning on doing that anytime soon. So, the best way to get it right now is MagicCon Vegas, or the next time they do one of those uh, MagicCon drops that they do right. on the Secret Lair website. Next up, uh, releasing on November 15th, is going to be Magic foundations or what you would call a magic the gathering set uh if you <laughs> called it a magic the gathering set that'll be coming out uh, that'll be in standard for five years uh, and yes. that's the main point of it to make a nice foundation for standard mm -hmm. uh, it's in the name up next the a foundation it's in the for standard it's in the name <laughs> it's in the name mm -hmm. next up uh, the remastered set for next year which we'll be releasing in january is going to be innistrad remastered very exciting. A very beloved plane. And they're not just doing the original Innistrad. They're, they're going to be doing all of the various Innistrad sets like they've been doing with Dominaria Remastered, like they did with Ravnica Remastered, pulling from all of the different Ravnica planes, all the, diff or all the different Ravnica sets, all the different Dominaria sets. So yep. a lot of fun stuff. The, the Innistrad stuff, uh, they, there's some very uh, well-known cards, very notable mm -hmm. cards, and I'm sure we'll see some pretty... Maybe not as exciting chase cards, uh, but there will still be some good ones in there. Oh, absolutely. All right. Now we're going to step into a little bit of a, a, a little gray area here. So a couple years ago, we uh, had wizards actually tell us, hey, here's what's coming. Here's what mm -hmm. you expect. Haven't done that in a while. So right now we have some code names and some uh, and the idea of what they're going to be. So in 2025, we have code name Tennis. And that's going to be our Racing World uh, set. That's going to be in Q1. We're going to next go to Ultimate, which is going to be a return to Tarkir in Q2. Mm -hmm. Volleyball will be the Space Opera in Q3. Wrestling will be a return to Lorwyn in Q4. In addition, we also have the Universes Beyond sets of both Marvel and Final Fantasy. Then in 2026, we have two more that we know. We have Yachting which will return to Arcavios or the Strixhaven uh, set, or Strixhaven plane. And finally, Zipline, which will be the conclusion of the Omen Path arc. Mm -hmm. Yeah, more recently, they've talked a little bit about this stuff. Not really anything like concrete or, or actionable information, really. Uh, but that Zipline set in 2026 is going to be kind of like a March of the Machines, War of the Spark style, like 
really just deep magic lore and storytelling set, which is always very exciting. I think those sets are some of the most fun that we get. Uh, excited to go to Tarkir and Lorwyn for the first time since we've been playing yeah. the game, which is going to be very cool. Uh, space Opera, I feel like, is just going to be Star Wars, the magic version. <laughs> I mean, here's hoping. Here's hoping. It's, it's going to be, uh, uh, what? oh, what's the legally distinct uh, legally distinct star wars yeah 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 you can't sue us star wars uh and then racing world i feel <laughs> like i feel like the I racing mean, world set is going to be like the last remnant of the we're just doing a weird concept as a set thing that we've had in 2024 for a lot of these mm, that's fair yeah because i mean we've had what we've had the mystery film we've had the the western <laughs> We've yeah. had the anthropomorphized animals, which was honestly just kind of a cool plane. But that was also because it was a plane, and like you could do a story there on yeah. a plane. And then we had the horror movie reference set. So now we're going to get the racing movie <laughs> reference set, and maybe we'll <laughs> calm down on that. But yeah, a lot of, a lot of fun, exciting stuff. I think those, the universes beyond Marvel, um, we're... I'm, we fell off of Marvel pretty hard after after Endgame. Yeah. Um, we watched some of the stuff that came out after, and it just kind of, the quality was going down. So that was a whole thing. But I think this Marvel set's going to be really cool. We've seen some leaks. We talked about it on the last episode, some of the leaks uh, that we got for like a Marvel secret lair, which seemed pretty mm-hmm. cool. And, and obviously I love Final Fantasy, so I'm probably going to be building a couple Final Fantasy decks because it's Final Fantasy. <laughs> it's a whole thing. I- Anyway, let's get into the meat and potatoes of this. Uh, The future of Commander. On the future of Commander, this announcement was made on magic.wizards.com on September 30th, 2024. The past week has been tumultuous for Commander fans, members of the Commander Rules Committee and the Magic community as a whole. Along the way, we've seen players and fans share a diverse range of passionate opinions, far too many of which were harmful or malicious. Below and over the next few days and weeks, we will be discussing quite a bit about Commander, starting with the most pressing. Over the past week, the conversation has escalated, culminated with unacceptable personal threats to the safety of the members of the Commander Rules Committee. This is something we will not tolerate. No matter how you feel about something in Magic, it is never appropriate to threaten someone. Everyone at Wizards of the Coast is united on this front, and we will not hesitate to take action against individuals who threaten to harm community members or employees. Uh, I think that is a good thing to start with here, uh, to to frame this conversation. The reason this has happened is because of unhinged psychopathic people on the internet that are just protected by anonymity and can feel like they can say anything online with no ramifications. And I think I think I speak for us both when we say that this is it's abhorrent and has no place here. Yes. Uh, you know, this is, we've seen this time and time again, um, often directed at wizards, mm-hmm. um, which as, you know, we have no love for a corporation. You know, we appreciate the things that they're putting out because that's that's what our fandoms lie. However, um, now that you're bringing in five individual people who, and they go on to stay in the company, you know, this is not their job. This is something they're trying to help the community with. Yeah. That's, it, it's, it's frankly disgusting. It, absolutely disgusting. Horrifying, even. But I feel like people are forgetting how to operate on the internet. Like, and you can curate your internet. You can curate your timelines. If you see something you don't like, you don't need to lash out in anger and hatred and vitriol in people. You can block and mute and move on. You need to curate your own experience so that you're not being bombarded with these things that you don't like. And I think in a lot of ways, if people were dealing with... I, if they were dealing with their emotions by simply removing themselves from the situation instead of lashing out... Uh, I, I think it would be a much more positive experience online for like everyone in the community. Um, but because of these threats of violence, because of death threats to members of the rules committee, uh, some things are going to be changing now. Quote, 
This week, has, this week has also demonstrated the truly monumental f- task that faced the Commander Rules Committee. The Commander RC is made up of five talented, caring individuals, all with other jobs and lives which they must balance with managing the most popular format in Magic. It results in incredible amounts of work, time spent deliberating, and exposure to the public. Nobody deserves to feel unsafe for supporting the game they love. Unfortunately, the task of managing Commander has far o- outgrown the scope and safety of being attached to any five people. So today, in partnership with members of the existing Rules Committee, we are announcing that the Rules Committee is giving management of the Commander format to the game design team of Wizards of the Coast. Of Wizards of the Coast. I can't believe I messed up the name of the company of all things. That's embarrassing beyond belief. Uh, quote, Commander has always been a community-focused format, and this move in management does not change that. While ownership of the format may be changing, members of the Rules Committee and others in the community will continue to be involved, and the vision for a social format will not change. We've had some preliminary conversations already about what we would like to accomplish and have some ideas we will be rolling out together in the months to come. Working with the community to craft this format is critical to all of us. We have opened a new Discord channel on the official Magic Discord, is uh, Commander News channel, and they had a weekly Magic live stream Uh, on Twitch for the uh, weekly MTG stream that they do uh, to to, uh, give some more details about that. We'll get into that once we're through with this article. Um, So... Wizards of the Coast is complete, has complete control of the format now. This is like every other constructed format that exists uh, for Magic. And as we've been able to see from other formats, this is totally never once caused any problems or controversy whatsoever uh, looking at hashtag Nadu Summer uh, for modern. Um, so preliminary thoughts on are you concerned with wizards taking over the commander format if that's going to affect how they design cards if it's going to affect how bannings happen the time frame that it takes for bans to happen ultimately when i saw this come across i i think that there's not that much to be concerned right now yeah I think that the people who are going to be in control of this have shown that they understand what is going on um, and are actively participating and discussing the same things we are. Mm-hmm. I think there has been you know, a, an initial concern that this would be profit-driven, and of course Wizards of the Coast as a company is going to be profit-driven. Hasbro is going to be profit-driven because that's how companies are. Um, but the people who seem to be most involved in this are players, are mm-hmm. designers. Um, and uh, it, it, it's mentioned further down and later in other, in other things we'll talk about, but they're aware of the mistakes they've made. In fact, the, the cards that were recently banned, specifically mm-hmm. Nadu, Jeweled Lotus, and... Uh, Dockside, they consider mistakes. Even mm-hmm. Arcane Signet and Soul Ring could be considered mistakes mm-hmm. because of how they just uh, blank the format as as a single build track, you know? And that is what... Uh, uh, that is what the community has said they wanted, is to make sure that they can play whatever cards they want, that there's not necessarily a best way to play the game. Unless and you I've... need to run Soul Ring and Arcane Signet. <laughs> right. <laughs> what are your thoughts on it? Well, they, they mentioned Soul Ring and Arcane Signet as being possible uh, uh, design mistakes, but they... They have mediated that by the fact that they get printed all the fucking time. So, like, they're not expensive cards. Everybody has them. If you buy a pre-con, you have them. Um, so, I, there's a lot of people that are like, oh, if you're trying to ban fast mana, why do you still have Soul Ring? Why do you still have these things? And it's like, I think they were just trying to make a statement. Um, mana Crypt has been ridiculously expensive for a while because it was printed basically once for a long time back in the 90s and it wasn't even like a regular set it was like a promo card basically it was never meant to see the kind of play that it did um but 
they they've seen what they've done with things like Nadu, with Jeweled Lotus, with Dockside Extortionist, and how that's warped the format around those cards. And I think at least right now, the design team understands that they have they're going to have a lot more scrutiny put on them. Uh, now that they're in control of the format as well, and people are going to meet whatever bannings or unbannings they may or may not partake in with a lot more of a critical eye uh, than previous bannings may have had. Um, ultimately, I mean, obviously, I think the format is just generally better without Mana Crypt, without Jeweled Lotus, without Dockside at casual tables, I would like mm -hmm. to add. Uh, competitive uh, CEDH is obviously taking a massive hit here in terms of value. I think simply because of the value of the in inherent in the cards, there should have been, it should have been handled a much differently with a longer time table. Because um, I mean, they mentioned Dockside several times over the last couple of years as a card they're looking at. Um, Jeweled Lotus was mentioned as being looked at when it was first printed, and that was it. Um, so just kind of better communication along the way of the cards they were looking at would have been better. But um, I'm more intrigued about what they're going to be doing going forward, particularly uh, with their next segment uh, of this article. What's next? Um, while it's still very early, we do want to share one of the things we just started working on with the Rules Committee, a more objective approach to deck power level and additional guidance in shared language for players to find games that match the type of game they're trying to play. Uh, they want to note that they are building this with the community. They're considering kind of like an open beta. So we, we know we've, there's been the 10 power levels that the community has kind of adopted for Commander decks for a while, and everyone's a 7, unless you're playing CEDH or a Precon. So the, the system has kind of been diluted down already into like a couple of power levels that people just say their decks are with kind of no objectivity to it. So they have an idea. Quote, there are four power brackets and every commander deck can be placed in one of those brackets by examining the cards and combinations in your deck and comparing them to lists we will need the community to help to create. You can imagine a bracket. You can imagine bracket one is the baseline of an average pre-constructed deck or below, and bracket four is high power. For lower tiers, we may lean on a mixture of cards and description of how a deck functions, and the higher tiers are likely defined by more explicit lists of cards. For example, you can imagine bracket one has cards that easily go in any deck, like Swords to Plowshares, Grave Titan, and Cultivate, whereas bracket four would have cards like Vampiric Tutor, Armageddon, and Grim Monolith, cards that make games too much more consistent, lopsided, or faster than the average deck can engage with. In this system, your deck could be defined by its highest bracket card or cards. This makes it clear what cards go where and what kinds of cards you can expect people to be playing. For example, if Ancient Tomb is a bracket four card, your deck would generally be considered a four. But if it's part of a tomb themed deck, the conversation may be, my deck is a four with Ancient Tomb, but a two without it. Is that okay with everyone? With this system guarantee, will this system guarantee perfectly matched games? No, and that might be fine at your table, but if it gets the conversation started, from a shared understanding that's already great for the table we would love to hear what you think about power brackets and would place certain cards uh in what bracket and you can give that information over on their discord and they're obviously going to be listening to the community and i wouldn't be surprised if they put out like a survey or something in the near future to kind of gauge what types of cards come up a whole lot for these brackets uh obviously i think like tier one doesn't need to have specific cards put into it at all um, I think tier two is probably going to have a lot of like those staples that you see. I think honestly, I would, I would imagine bracket two being something like sorts to plowshares, like cultivate, like arcane signet, soul ring, those cards that you see a lot that get reprinted a lot in, um, in pre-cons. And then tier one is basically just everything not on the list. Um, I think people are going to be upset with the specificity of what cards are in what bracket, but ultimately it's impossible to objectively measure the power level of a deck. And I've seen a lot of, of people online talking about like, well, what if someone 
just lies or someone like uses the system to their advantage and like gains the system is like, Ooh, there's a tier three card here that is way better than the other tier three cards. So I'm just going to put that, those kinds of cards in and make it a tier. And it's like, those kinds of people are already saying their decks a seven while running mana crypt and jeweled Lotus. So I, I don't think we should be designing our, our system of measuring these decks around those kinds of people. What do you think of the four tier system, the bracket system? And do you have any kind of cards you would want to see in certain tiers or on the list at all? I, I appreciate their effort in trying to uh, uh, cultivate an experience where people continue to have the rule zero conversation. Mm -hmm. However, I don't think that this level of specificity, like you said, with the individual cards, is going to be able to simply to simplify this conversation as they're hoping. Um, like you like you said, there there are plenty of cards that do similar things. But like this version may be very good, you know. Like obviously, mm -hmm. uh, there are plenty of cards that that ramp you, right? Like, but some of them are better because yeah. they get more more things onto the battlefield. They get them untapped. They do it for life instead of mana. They can do it at instant. There are all these things that are you gonna, you know, you're the ulti ultimately. If you really wanted to have this this super defined um, uh, a way to know how powerful your deck is, then you would have to have your deck list constantly updated in a in a system like Moxfield or, or um, Architect, and then those systems would have to be able to also tell, you know, rank all of your cards, and then you'd have to put in your win percentage with this deck, and uh, ultimately, yes, ultimately, the rule zero conversation needs to be had. And you need to be, you know, to have the best experience to be sure that you are sitting down to a place that is going to be fun for you to play. Even if you do that, you're not going to have the greatest experience every time. It's going mm -hmm. to come down to who you're playing with, what, you know, what the environment is, what you had for breakfast, you know? Yeah. A hearty breakfast is a very important part of any good Magic the Gathering game. Um, I kind of disagree. I like, I kind of like this four bracketed system. Um, Moxfield has already been out on Twitter and talking about like, hey, we would be happy to integrate this system into our uh, our platform. Uh, our architect, uh, I'm sure, is interested in that kind of stuff too. Of these these digital deck list uh, repositories, um, but we have to, the way I look at it is the rule zero conversation is something that a lot of people don't have, or they have it in a way that's not very helpful um having i think having a list of certain cards that either like armageddon have a very high salt level associated with them like people don't like when armageddon is cast and resolved against them just because it makes the game go long or that ones that objectively are more powerful like your ancient tombs your your one mana tutors that sort of thing um Grim Monolith, Basalt Monolith, like, Mana Vault, that kind, the, the higher power stuff, Mox Opal. Um, but obviously, obviously the, any system that they develop is not going to be perfect. Uh, and I would argue that getting community input and, and looking at certain cards that are objectively just very, very powerful. Like you look at, CEDH staples that still exist. Uh, obviously, there's no longer Mana Crypt, Mana Vault, or Man Mana Crypt, Jeweled Lotus, Dockside Extortionist, Nadu are all gone. But there's still tons of cards that see play in basically any deck that it can be run in. I mean, Fierce Guardianship, a commander exclusive card, basically, uh, that is a top tier card. Now, would it be a tier four card? The, the discussion on that, I think, could be could could happen i mean ultimately it's just a free counter spell so right. and it's only free if your commander is in play so like would that be tier three tier four i think that minutia kind of doesn't really matter ultimately because i think the whole point is listen oh i'm sitting down at, at a at a table with like a precon and a guy that's playing his tomb themed deck 
And this guy says he has a tier four deck because he's got ancient tomb and he's got tutors and he's got all this kind of stuff, but he's not going to play like an asshole. Like it, the conversation, I think formatting it around specific cards is going to be better than kind of the vague, like, Oh, I'm just playing a seven or like it's an eight with it's an eight with, but, but it's only got like a vampiric tutor. You know, like, like what the, the conversations have been so vague and inconsistent in rule zero. I think the way we play, I think is pretty good. It's like, Hey, I'm sitting down with Abdel Adrian Gorian's ward and Candlekeep sage. This is an Azorius combo deck where I'm going to be blinking my stuff. It's going to be hard to remove my things because I can make it go away and come back. And I'm going to try and win by an infinite combo with Felidar Guardian with Sakashima of a Thousand Faces. Um, and I tell you how my deck is going to win so that you can recognize some of the signs. It's like, oh, he's got a lot of mana open. He just cast a Felidar Guardian. Do we need to deal with the Felidar Guardian? Do we need to deal with the Abdel Adrian? Do we like to try and disrupt that combo? Um, but a lot of people don't have that conversation. So mm -hmm. specifying around cards, I think, can help guide in the direction of more conducive Rule Zero conversations. But ultimately, it comes down to the community being able to figure out how to communicate, in my opinion. I, I think that if, I think that if we, if, with specific cards, the idea of it might get too diluted at some point, just because there's mm -hmm. so many cards. I would like to say take a step back, and um, this is usually what I see when it comes to um, the guys on EDH, the RecCast. They often talk about, well, when we talk about power level, we talk about almost in a very similar way to what you just presented, which is, you know, this deck has, you know, this is the commander, and I have, uh, I want to win by doing this, and I do have tutors in here because I want to, you know, I need it to be consistent, or I have a lot of free, you know, free interaction because that's how I play, you know, things mm -hmm. like that. I think that level is definitely a very, is the, going to lead into a more helpful Rule yeah. Zero conversation. Absolutely. And I I would love to see how this plays out. Um, the community is very divided on this, obviously. Um, but I would love to see them like put out a survey, start to put out like preliminary lists of cards, just so we can see how the specifics of it start playing out. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, we've got a total of, what, seven cards here they've talked about, and right. they, you, you can't really get a vibe off of that. So I'm, I'm more intrigued by what comes out of that. But... Uh, if we move on to uh, the weekly MTG stream that they talked about having on the 1st of October, uh, there is a Reddit thread that kind of bullet point lists all of the important things. Um, a couple, we're just going to run through this bulleted list. I found it on Twitter, reposted many, many times, uh, but it is in the, I believe it's r slash EDH. Yeah, r slash EDH. Uh, it's one of the top discussions there. Uh, first bullet point, quote, we all, Wizards of the Coast and Rules Committee, reached this conclusion together. Uh, they are taking precautions to ensure the safety of Rules Committee members. They still want to keep it a community-driven format. Uh, Gavin Verhe also plans to establish a committee similar to the Popper format panel, Rules Committee, and uh, uh, the CAG members are likely members that they would be eyeing for that kind of uh, committee. Uh, the Popper committee, I think, is one of the most well-liked methods for, for handling a constructed format that we've seen uh, from Magic. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not opposed to that, but it also just kind of feels a little bit like, here, we're getting rid of these guys, but we're also going to get other guys that do effectively the same thing. Um, Aaron addresses worries about profit-driven actions. Quote, I'm also here for the love of the game, like the rules committee. Yes, Hasbro wants things. Yes, my bosses want things. I have, lot of, I have a lot of freedom to do what I think is best. Our goal is to make things last forever. Keeping the community happy is our way to make money, end quote. Uh, I think that is one of the biggest fears going on with, with this absorption of handling the commander format um do you think that this is just kind of ideolog like an ideologic platitude in a way because like obviously the people on the ground floor are going to be wanting the the game to grow and be community driven and that will make money but will it make enough money to keep the bosses off their back enough that they're able to actually do it 
That is a very good question. Um, and I'm sure Aaron is being a little ideal, you know, idealistic here. Um, we hope for the best, but Watsi has, I mean, in the past two years, really experienced the wrath of the of the community um, a lot from the Dungeons and Dragons side, and and definitely a lot from the Magic the Gathering side. I mean, just look at how much of a debacle Magic Thirty, followed by the uh, March of the Machines aftermath, mm -hmm. um, experiences were for them. Um, I'm I'm sure we'll still see the corporate thumb pressing down a lot but the hope is that yes it continues that the the people with boots on the ground are given are given the uh, the trust the the way that i see it is hasbro doesn't really care too much about the health of specific formats i would bet they care more about the sale of products and by whatever means they're getting product sales to go up to improve I think they're kind of okay with. I mean, you look at the universes beyond initiatives that they've been having. I mean, a universes beyond with Marvel is going to be huge. A universes beyond with Magic the Gathering is going to, or uh, uh, Final Fantasy and Magic the Gathering is going to be huge. I know, Magic the Gathering universes beyond. <laughs> That'd be wow. Magic oh boy. They just no. They start taking real life people and then making them cards. <laughs> I would like to cast my commander, Gavin Verhe. Yes, yes. It lets me just design a card that's wild. Gavin right the Great. The Gavin the Great. He's a common legendary human wizard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> that'd be hilarious. But I think that's going to be what they push. And obviously there's going to be big cards that are staples in various formats. I mean, Modern is still going to drive sales. Modern Horizons is basically resetting the format every time it comes out, like it's going to drive sales. Um, and there's still big cards that are not going to, they're probably not going to see a ban in a format like Commander. I mean, like Meat Hook Massacre, for example, is a powerful card. People love that card. It's an expensive card. And if they put it in, say, in a Strad Remastered, people are going to buy in a Strad Remastered for the same reason that people bought Ravnica to try and chase Cyclonic Rift for the same reason that people were buying Dominaria Remastered to try and chase like Vampiric Tutor and stuff. There's powerful cards uh, it, just because a couple of very expensive cards are no longer going to be reprint have reprint value because of their legality. doesn't mean that there aren't other valuable cards. Um, they are going to wait until a panel is established to talk about anything on the ban list uh, beyond, the, and this is one of the big ones, beyond the initial ban list changes, they don't want to make changes too often. Quarterly ban list updates similar to the rules committee, and it will not follow the ban and restricted announcements of other formats. That I think is the, the big worry here is that initial ban list sweep like mm -hmm. are we going to see uh another situation where valuable cards are being banned for the health of the format that's one thing people are concerned about another thing i would be concerned about is mass unbanning of certain cards and i think some of them really aren't as big of a deal like uh i think it's coalition victory it's the five color mm -hmm. sorcery that if you have a land of each type in play when you cast it you win the game it's an eight mana sorcery, you know? So like there's certain things that are on the ban list that are kind of not relevant to how commander is now. And so it's fine to get rid of them. Um, but what, what worries would you have about an initial ban list change? Um, so on that, uh, before that, I will say there has been a lot of talk and a lot of uh, people are, um, uh, uh, hedging their bets right now, and a lot of these banned cards are actually seeing an uptick mm -hmm. in sales and thus price because of how it works on a um, on a stock like uh, based format. But honestly, if they were to un start unbanning cards, I think that based on what they've said so far and about how they're aware of how the format plays and what the community wants i don't think that too many extreme i don't think i don't like for example see a a complete you know wipe of the ban list coming or anything i think that there are 
like you said, things on the ban list that don't need to be there anymore. Mm-hmm. I would hope that those cards actually get the chance to come out and see the light of day, whether yeah. it's uh, whether it's a, a win con like Coalition Victory or anything like that. Do you think we're going to see an unbanning of any of these four cards that just got banned? I mean, so far they've said that they don't want to touch those quite yet. Um, I mean, I... I, I don't think I see an immediate one. I could see it down the line, but that could be said for any card uh, that has been banned. I, I only bring that up because obviously Nadu is not going to be taken off the list. That one was just a disaster for every format that it was legal in. Dockside, I wouldn't see that, but I could totally see them unbanning Jeweled Lotus specifically just because it's a mm-hmm. Lotus card. It was the, f- the face of the Commander Master set, you know? Yeah, it was the chase card, and there were like five different art variants of it. Like that's a big thing, and it's a card that, outside of a very niche interaction in like timeless and vintage, it it doesn't have a use for any other format outside of Commander. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if they um, if they unban Jeweled Lotus specifically. But I also feel like that's one of the least of the worries of the cards on the format. That's just kind of like a quick burst to get your commander out. And then if you swords to plowshare, it gets swords to plowshare, it gets fatal pushed, it gets whatever, then it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You know, um, let's see, let's see. Power brackets, examples, tier one swords to plowshare, tier two's Thalia. So like stacks pieces would be a little bit higher on the tier. Not surprising. Tier three Draneth Magistrate I find interesting because I feel like Draneth Magistrate's a, four, a tier four card. We talked many many episodes ago. We were asked about what cards we would ban, and Draneth Magistrate was the top of my list just because it's a card that is antithetical to the commander format. It just stops people from being able to cast their commanders. Mm-hmm. Um, so. I, that's interesting there. Tier 4 Armageddon. Uh, Aaron Forsyth apparently used to play Armageddon, and the writer of this, uh, the writer of this uh, 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 Reddit thread was none too pleased by that, based on shocked the emoji usage. Shocked and appalled. Uh, they are not trying to replace Rule Zero, but simply trying to make it easier. Uh, and they did specify with the rules committee, there will be at least one person from the CEDH community that will be part of the panel. And, but Watsi is still going to focus their cards and designing on casual commander. They will not set a separate ban list for CEDH and insists that brackets are going to do that job uh, well enough on their own. For example, Aaron said, quote, fourth bracket will be cards that you will rarely see in pre-cons. Um, and then Soul Ring is not going anywhere. Soul Ring is bracket zero, so to say, as in it should be able to go in everything. Um, that, I, for one, I think having a member of the CEDH community at the table for these conversations is important. Uh, but it the, the, the problem is this is a format that is not like the other formats in Magic like at all. If you're playing modern, you're playing the best cards in modern and you're trying to win. If you're playing standard, you're playing the best strategies in standard in standard and you're trying to win. In commander, you're pulling your punches, you're trying to have your deck do its thing. You want other people's decks to do the thing, and a lot of the times winning is just kind of a side thing that you can do at a game of commander. Um which makes bannings a little bit different. Um, ultimately I feel like CEDH is just playing the best cards in the format, regardless of what those cards are. And if they choose to ban Jeweled Lotus and Mana Crypt, then, you know, just like in modern, when they choose to ban, uh, what was it? Grief. You're just not going to be able to play Grief anymore. You're not going to be able to play Jeweled Lotus anymore. And you just have to adapt and change and play the best cards in the format at that point. Um, is that, do you think that's the right way to go about it? Or like, like in how 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 can a rules committee like do handle this around a casual format where winning isn't necessarily the objective for the game this really comes down to different strokes for different folks kind of thing like you said playing in other formats the goal is to sit down from your across from your opponent and to to try and win 
because otherwise you would be kind of insulting your opponent, uh, you know, with what you're doing. However, in Commander, in the casual aspect of Commander, we've had plenty of games where it's like, all right, I'm going to attack you. Well, I'm not going to attack you next turn, even though I could kill you outright from a Commander damage perspective. I'm going to go to the next person because I want to not make this game over in five minutes or something mm-hmm. like that. Um, and it is, you know, we have, I mean, even between us, uh, very different levels of competitiveness. Um, you are, you are a much more competitive person who enjoys winning That's more true. than I do. And then we have a friend who's even a next step up who, when they're sitting down, they're sitting down to win. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's why I say different different strokes for different folks makes it very hard. And we to, have another friend that just wants to do their thing and just annoy everyone, <laughs> <laughs> which is its own way very fun. It's also like, bro, what are we doing? But <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's very hard to it's uh, I don't want to say pander, but pander to everyone in all of these mm-hmm. different levels of things. And that's, uh, you know, that's hard. Yeah. Um, I'm going to kind of gloss over the rest of these points because I think they're just kind of, they all kind of, they're their own things or just little bits of information are kind of tied to what we've already been talking about. Um, a point simil- a point system similar to Canadian Highlander is a little bit too complex for and competitive for a casual commander, so obviously they wouldn't want to implement that. Implementing a system like that for CEDH, you could see that possibly happening, but I feel like a point system at that point, it's like you're trying to play all the best cards anyway, mm-hmm. so it doesn't really need to have a point system assigned to it. Uh, the Brawl format in Magic Arena already separates decks into four categories based on the contents of those decks. Uh, specifically called out, Jeweled Lotus, Arcane Signet, Dockside, etc. were mistakes. Cards that were banned recently are the kinds of cards they wouldn't make today, and they want to reduce ubiquitousness going forward. Uh, that's the only reason that I'm... Can, that I would be surprised if they went back on any of the recent four bannings. Oh, bark, 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 Bindi. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, upset baby. Um, let's see, they're discussing implementing more digital tools, like how to uh, you can enter a deck list onto a website to see uh, what bracket your deck would end up in. Obviously, we've already talked about like Moxfield Architect, I'm sure are already working to try and integrate that into their own platforms as well. Uh, they want to release their first Brackets article before MagicCon Las Vegas. So coming up in the next couple of weeks, by the next episode even, we might have an initial Bracket article to kind of get into some of the more nitty-gritty of what this would be. Uh, they want the committee to be in the range of 10 to 20 people. Uh, and also, there are also 10 commander designers working in Wizards of the Coast. So they don't want just design team people on this committee. And I think having more people in the room is ultimately going to be a little better for the format in general. Uh, five people, I feel like it's a little bit too easy for things to get swayed by one person. Um that's that's neither here nor there. I think it's just kind of same same thing, but different numbers. <laughs> um, they're not tied to four brackets. They could make a fifth bracket specific to CEDH. Uh, it's undecided whether the con- the committee will be anonymous. Uh, some of the names, at least some of them, are going to be known by the community. I would imagine any employees of Wizards of the Coast that are on the committee will definitely be known. Uh, and they can divide the com- and they can divide combos into different brackets as well. Like Thorical combo is a bracket four. Sanguine bond and Exquisite blood would be like bracket three, etc. Uh, and apparently Gavin reads Reddit quite a bit, so I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of these Reddit threads are are uh, are talked about. Uh, one more thing on this topic that I'm gonna I'm gonna go to before we wrap up our little conversation about this. Uh, before the announcement of Wizards of the Coast taking over, there was an announcement by a collective of. CEDH players, the Competitive Commander Collective, seemingly like a a second attempt at a CEDH-specific rules committee. Um, We did get uh, a tweet from Ken Bauman, who is kind of the the head of this little project. Um, Assemblers uh, of the Competitive Commander Collective are talking daily 
uh, now that Wizards of the Coast is manage managing commander, they're revised the CCC's description. Uh, they are reading community recommendations, uh, and they are f- and they are uh, looking to start scheduling interviews for around October fifteenth, and. They're, they're trying to figure out who they want to be part of this thing. So specifically on their website, the prior version of their goals, uh, help the communities sustainably grow, uh, give CEDH players a great games, experience great games, or help CEDH organizers run ex- excellent events. Uh, and they want it to be a wellspring of collaborative projects that expand and improve CEDH over the course of many years. Uh, they don't, they don't say anything about trying to make a separate ban list, but I think ultimately you can you can tell that that's how things are going to go. Um, they give a little bit of a schedule. Uh, this fall to winter, they're going to try and get com- solicit member recommendations, community feedback about the project. Uh, spring 2025, they're going to evaluate feedback uh, and dr- on the the draft slate of people they have, invite members, announce their first collective, uh, and organize listening sessions for members' local communities, determine the CCC structures and processes, and share what their 2025 goals are. Uh, summer of 2025, they want to design, share, and implement experiments, solicit and share member community findings, solicit community feedback, articulate... Pro- they're they're just they're wanting to go about this much slower than the original CEDH proposed rules committee was going to be. Uh, one mem- one person who is a part of this initiative is uh, comedy Ian, Ian on uh, various platforms. He's a big CEDH player, one of the best CEDH players that that we have in the world right now. Uh, and he's a friend of a friend. I've met him at Gen Con. We met him at Gen Con, and I reached out, and I got this quote from him uh, in email. Quote, I highly encourage anyone who is curious about the Competitive Commander Collective to check out our site as the collective has worked tirelessly to assemble a statement slash goals that we can all be proud of. I personally signed on to the project so that CEDH can feel like a home to the many voices, whether on a national or international level. My time playing CEDH professionally has exposed me to many different groups of people who all love this game. My deepest desire is for all of them to feel as if they have a place here. End quote. Um, so do you, we've already kind of touched on this and this is seemingly a second attempt at a rules committee specifically for CEDH. Do they need this? Will, will this bracket bracketing system kind of help fix it? Will the CEDH format change around Mana Crypt and Jeweled Lotus and Nadu and Dockside being banned enough in the time that ti- in the timetable that they have of next summer of 2025 that the need for a separate rules committee isn't really even necessary anymore. That's a that's a good question and I think it's one that we'll only be able to tell once time has has taken its toll because you know if if we want to get a little semantical here, you know. Uh, it's been, you know, pointed out that CEDH is not a format; it's just a subgenre of the EDH format. Mm-hmm. But the people who love to play it often have the complaint that they feel overlooked when rules are are proposed, are um, are implemented, or bannings are implemented, and things like that. Um, you know, it's going to be. It, we, there have been multiple attempts at this, like we said, in even as far as less than a month ago, and several in the past. So, again, it's very hard to just come out and say, is this needed? I don't know. Do the people who play that format feel it's needed, you know? I mean, there, there have been talk about splintering the format and making CEDH its own thing with its own separate ban list. And at that point, it's not CEDH anymore. It's yep. a different format, which if they want to make a different format, I think that's totally fine. Uh, having some some different rules around a four-player multiplayer format with a 100-card singleton decks and a commander, I think it's totally fine. We have other commander variants that I think are very fun. I love PEDH, for example, Popper mm-hmm. Commander. Uh, we've, we've played a fair bit of Oathbreaker as well with Planeswalkers and Signature Spells, and there's a lot of fun stuff out there. Um, ultimately, 
CEDH is always going to exist because there's always going to be people that want to play the commander format as it is, whatever the ban list is, and play the best cards in that format and try to win. Um, so if they want to splinter off and do their own thing, then at that point, you're not really splintering off. You're just kind of making a new format, which is, which is totally fine if you so desire to do that. The moment they have a separate ban list, if they, if they announce a separate ban list and people start adopting it, I think that's when we reach the point where it's like you do, you're not playing CEDH anymore. You're playing a different game, mm-hmm. um, which, again, is totally fine if you want to do that. But I don't think that's going to end up being necessary. I imagine by this time next year, once they've had a chance to assemble this competitive commander collective and stuff, that um, it's not really going to be as necessary anymore. Because I think a lot of the heat will have died down. I think the format will have adjusted uh, and people have probably moved on. It, People are already starting to move on, <laughs> and we're we're not even a month out from this. So, yeah. you know, uh, do you have anything else you want to say about uh, Wizards of the Coast taking over control of the format? About the Commander uh, Competitive Commander Collective? Any any other final thoughts? I think that uh, I hope that what we are saying uh, is heard, and that people, you know, will take our advice when we say. Do some thinking before you're acting. Mm-hmm. It's not it's not going to be the end of the world. You know, we experienced the end of the world four years ago with uh, with a pandemic. Mm-hmm. And Your four years is- before that with a presidential election and four years before that because the Mayan calendar and four years before. Yeah. It, the world's going to be fine. <laughs> yep. You just need to breathe. Take yes. it in. Breathe it out. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Um, keep the hate and vitriol out. And also, if you do feel the need to do those things, attach your name to it. Uh, I, I really hate seeing all these anonymous accounts with like an anime profile picture that you have no clue who this person actually is that are spewing all this hate. They're spewing all of these threats and stuff. It's like, if you're going to be that kind of person... Attach your name to it and deal with the ramifications of that action because you know that there would be ramifications if you did do that. So at that point, that should probably be the red flag to not. Anyway, moving on. That's that's enough that's enough commander controversy for now. Let's move on to the Dungeon Master's Guide. Uh, they've started releasing information on the 2024 revision of D&D's 5th uh, edition Dungeon Master's Guide. Uh, it's going to be coming out on November 12th, which is very exciting. We're about a month away. And they've been doing some articles, doing some videos on the D&D YouTube channel, talking about the various things included in uh, the Dungeon Master's Guide. Uh, you can already pre-order it for $60. Uh, it's already available on D&D Beyond at various platforms as well. Uh, they, the information that the articles and stuff have provided is kind of the same level of information that we've been getting already. Uh, we, I, I heard all of this at Gen Con when they had the, the press out for an event there. Um, 400 new and improved magic items and rules for crafting. I want them to dig into the rules for magic item crafting more than anything else, honestly, because I think that's going to be like a big crux for, for this, uh, dungeon master's guide. Obviously the bastion system, we've kind of already seen a beta version of that through play test. Uh, I like how they're changing the format to get uh, a dungeon master advice for jun- dungeon masters kind of at the beginning of the book, making it an actual guide for dungeon masters, kind of like the name would imply. Uh, it has a pre-written adventure as well as handouts and ready to play maps that take place in Greyhawk. Uh, and Greyhawk is apparently going to be to some extent customizable. Uh, and then the lore glossary for all of the the D and D pantheon and stuff and legends in uh, uh, Dungeons and Dragons that people might not be familiar with. Um, obviously, I think we're kind of waiting for more information to really like sink our teeth into this. Uh, but it is, I, I think, it's pretty exciting that we're we're finally starting to get the the ramp up of information for this. Yeah, we've uh, we've been we've been looking at the player's handbook so much, so much over the past ha- six months. Mm-hmm. Um, and and you know, kind of jokingly said, "Oh, oh no, we have all these cool subclasses, but we can't play." Well, now soon the dungeon master uh, guide coming out. It's going to have 
it's going to have a lot that, you know, gives uh, gives more people things to talk about. The Bastions, like you said, is going to be super cool. That's something we've played with for a while is different Bastion systems. Mm -hmm. We did the, um, what was it, uh, MCDM's Fortresses Stronghold and Strongholds? And followers. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that one. That one's a fun system. I like the idea of taking a Bastion turn outside of like game sessions and stuff. Like something to do. Like yeah. if your session gets canceled, and that it, it it provides an interesting dimension. Um, magic item crafting is is in my mind the biggest thing because magic item crafting has just kind of sucked <laughs> unless you've been an artificer. <laughs> um, so. I'm excited to see when we start to actually get more information, and I have a feeling that we're probably not going to be getting more information until the embargo for review copies of it is lifted. So, yeah. Which, by the way, wizards, if you want to, if you want to send us a copy, feel free. Uh, they won't I, at this point. We haven't gotten an email, so we're probably not. <laughs> uh, last thing, little little wrap up item here. Uh, Peta. That Peta. Mm -hmm. The one, the one that everyone kind of doesn't like. <laughs> People eating uh, tasty animals. That's no true. wait, um, no. Uh, let's go with that. Um, they released a free downloadable PDF for Dungeons and Dragons subclasses that they have. There are three: uh, the Circle of Empathy Druid. Uh, kind of uh, the guiding principle. If empathy for all living beings fades, the world will be will unravel, torn asunder by cruelty, and lost to the discord that separates us from the natural order. Uh, it's got its own circle spells. It's got a, it's a whole subclass. Um, it, the druid, the druid is probably my least favorite one. Uh, the cringiest one is the paladin. Mm. <laughs> The Oath of Animal yeah. Liberation. <laughs> a paladin vows to protect all sentient beings, championing their freedom and challenging any forces that seek to oppress or harm them. Um, the uh, who? Okay. Um, I think the I think it's one of the more fascinating mechanically. Uh, they have a channel divinity at third level. Uh, they get two options: beast fury. You can use channel divinity to give yourself or an ally the ferocity of a wild beast for a minute. Uh, you deal an extra one d six d six. Oh my god! Uh, extra one d six damage <laughs> on melee on uh, melee attacks, and you have a chance to inflict them with fear, where they have to make a wisdom saving throw against your spell save DC, or become frightened of you. I think that's a very powerful channel of divinity, all things yeah, considered, is. especially at level 3. Um, their expanded spell list is good, they got some good healing spells, uh, revivify, spirit guardians, uh, greater restoration for 5th level. Um... Paladin, that paladin seems particularly powerful. Another powerful one, the third one, the ranger subclass, Warden of the Wild. Uh, a Warden of the Wild ranger devotes themselves to shielding animals from harm, acting as guardians of nature's balance. They stand against those who exploit or endanger animals. Uh, they also have an ex expanded spell list. Some very powerful ones, I might add. Charm person, entangle, hold person, dispel magic, polymorph, reincarnate. Um shockingly powerful spell list uh the abilities are a little bit more niche than uh the paladin in terms of combat prowess but you still get a lot of uh a lot of utility there as a ranger which is very fun they have a couple of spells that they added liberate a first level transmutation spell where you can free any animal from magical or mundane restraints including cages bindings and mind control um the target, the spell targets any being of the beast or dragon type. So apparently dragons are now protected by PETA, which is interesting. Uh, the Crimson Mark, which is a first level illusion for an action. You can hold the concentration up to an hour. Uh, you cast the spell to call upon the forces of justice in order to mark those who hunt or otherwise harm animals. <laughs> when, <laughs> when you cast the spell, choose a being within range you believe to be guilty of cruelty. <laughs> Their malevolence will be revealed with a crimson, with a visible crimson mark. <laughs> 
uh, a couple of magic items as well. The Sanctuary Key is a rare, wondrous item. It's a magical key that can unlock any cage or trap that holds animals. And then the Rescue Satchel is a uncommon, wondrous item. Uh, magically expanding bag that can safely carry up to five tiny or two small creatures, providing them with comfortable and secure temporary home. Uh, so obviously tons of cringe in this. But mechanically, some of the subclasses are pretty cool. <laughs> you know, we we've been we've been big proponents that Dungeons and Dragons is a game for everyone, and this you know you, you know what somebody somebody out there I believe it says who helped make these. Um, I don't I see it directly. I right literally now. just closed it. I literally just closed it. All right, hold on. Um, Let's see. PETA's Dungeons & Dragons are unofficial fan comment, permitted under fan content policy, not approved or endorsed. Okay. Oh, here it is. Uh, oh, well. The PDF doesn't say it. <laughs> no, but anyway, I, anyway, it's for everybody. And uh, actually, we do have a, we have a friend who, uh, we only played one or two sessions with her, but this is a, this, she's a vegan, and this is the kind of thing she would love. Yeah, good for her. Good for her. Um, that paladin seems pretty powerful, though. That channel Pretty ability, common. the channel divinity ability. It's a very cringe name, though. I would definitely want oh, to absolutely, yeah. homebrew the name <laughs> away from that. But I mean, I honestly wouldn't be opposed to playing that paladin. Uh, that is all we have for the news items for this week. Uh, we will get into questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and or ideas as we do every single week at the end of the podcast. Uh, you can go to patreon.com slash the dungeon bros. If you join for free, even you get access to the questions thread every single week where it gets posted uh, uh, several days before we record. Um, we kind of already got into this, uh, but Brandon said, do you think there will be a separate ban list for CEDH? And if so, how would you separate CEDH and EDH? Uh, we kind of talked about it already, but um, if they were to separate and do separate ban lists, it would just need to be a different format. In my estimation, absolutely. Uh, I don't. I don't know. I don't know how you would handle that, but that's pretty much what I would do. I would say. I would say the same thing. Is is, you know, you know what? Let's uh, let's let's just go. Let's go whole hog on this. Unban every card. That <laughs> CDH. They they will only play the cards that are worth playing. You know. I think I think it would be very fun to see a, a four-player multiplayer format where every single card that has ever been printed in Magic the Gathering is legal. Uh, would it be exceptionally homogenous? Yes, because everyone would be playing the Moxes, everyone would be playing Black Lotus, everyone like the format would get very dull. I think, but I think that uh, I think that you would. I mean, we already see this in CDH. There are meta decks. There are there there. You know the decks when when somebody. Oh, I, who? What are we playing? All right, we got a Rogsai over here. We got a we got Blue whatever. Farm. We got Blue Farm. we got Kinnon. Uh, like you know what Timna, to expect. Yeah, Timnacrom. And I mean that's the way it is in most other formats. Is you got these well known, especially the the like vintage and legacy and Canlander. You have these decks that are named, and uh, people are still taking those decks and trying to weave in new cards, trying to find what what they might have missed in some other iteration, or when like a a mechanical change happens mm -hmm. where new cards or old cards can fit in. I think we'd see more of that. And yeah. you know, like you said, there would definitely be a lot of uh, <coughs> standard bearers in there, if you will. But that's not necessarily um, unprecedented or a bad thing. Yes, yes, I agree. I agree. Um, yeah, that's that's all we have in terms of questions from the Patreon. Shout out to Brandon Vol, our fifteen dollar a month patron. He's he's been one of the OGs for a very long time. Uh, I'm I'm working on a live streaming setup for Monday Night Magic to come back so we can we can play a game with him and all of that. Uh, he was messaging me recently on Patreon about um, he got excited thinking that SCG Con was coming back to Cincinnati, uh, but it was the old SCG Con website that they still have up from 2024. <laughs> Uh, they're not coming. They're not coming to Cincy this year uh, because of the Duke Energy Convention Center construction stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. But there's one in Columbus, so that might be a thing I do for one of the days. Who knows? Um, I don't normally pull this out, 
but this one struck a chord with me in the comments section of our YouTube channel. Okay. Okay. Two episodes ago, episode 75, we talked about will the CEDH Rules Committee fail or why did the CEDH Rules Committee fail? We got a, we got a comment two weeks ago from Christopher Martin 1315. He said, season one of Rings of Power is straight ass. There will be no revisionist history about that. Season two is better. Season one is god awful. You're entitled to your opinion. And I hope it's not embarrassing when I reply to that comment in eight to 10 years being like, hey, remember how good, you know how everyone says this was really good now? <laughs> What's up with that? <laughs> season two is so good. <laughs> season two is so, so good. Season one is just a setup for, for the whole series. Season two is just really good. Anyway, that was, that was a personal vendetta that I felt the need to... Uh, I felt the need to call out a little bit from the YouTube comments section. Anyway, uh, feel free to, if you're watching the video on YouTube, feel free to leave a comment and it might get read if it's, if it's particularly egregious like this man's was. Anyway, um, that is all the time we have for this episode of the Duels of Man Dorks podcast, episode 77 of the Duels of Man Dorks podcast. We hope you have a wonderful time. We hope Commander calms the fuck down for a little bit and... Do you, have any, do you have anything you'd like to say, Sam? Anything? Any, any parting wisdom to implore, Im, implore, impose upon the audience? Uh, again, just, you know, listen to our calming words. I wouldn't say our calming voices, but our calming words. <laughs> do the right thing. You know, when everybody else is out there making death threats, apparently. Right. <laughs> do the right thing. Remove yeah. Nadu from that deck. Remove that Jeweled Lotus from that deck. Are you have you have you taken Nadu out and go on with your life? Have you have you taken Nadu out of your uh, Ivy Glethal Spell Thief deck yet? Or uh, yeah, yes, I have. Okay, okay. I would love to see you cast it and be like, oh, uh, uh. <laughs> all right. I take four damage from Mana Burn, and he goes into exile. <laughs> 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 or three damage from Mana Burn because he's only three. Anyway, only three. that that one that one green blue legendary mana cost creature that they design is just constantly fucked legendary something even with oko it's a planeswalker it's like one generic green blue yeah. it just it fucks everything anyway <laughs> that is all the time we have this week on the duels of mana Dogs podcast we love you very much stay safe and as always 